Have you ever really looked at Moses, specifically studying his life story, as it relates to him being a type of Christ? I don't know if you've ever really done that, like intentfully, thoughtfully, just how is he a type of Christ? Well, that that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, but first, I want to clear up a bit of confusion, because this is part 10 in, a, in so far, 10-part series, we'll add more later, but to Jesus in the Old Testament. And some people may not realize that when I say he's a type of Christ, I don't mean he's a Christ. The word type just means he's like a foreshadowing. He represents the kind of person Jesus would be. It's, it's just that there's a comparison. It's like he's a metaphor, like a living metaphor for what Jesus would be like. But there's more to that. And if anyone you know, is having questions about what does it mean that Moses is a type of Christ, then just go to the first video in the series, Jesus in the Old Testament, and you can see um, how to find Jesus in the Old Testament. You can see it all there. But right now we're going to dig in. Uh, G- Jesus and Moses, how are they related? I found there were more connections, I think, between these two than I had originally realized as I was just studying and preparing. And, and I'll just say this up front, for the most part, my study and prep has pretty much been just me going off of what I've read and knowing the scriptures and reading through the story of Moses going, this seems like a connection, this seems like a connection. Um, I, I, after I was done preparing the study, I went and I found another pastor's list of ways in which Moses was a type. And I think I added one more to my list from his list that I thought, ooh, that seems really good. Um, I don't say this to be like, oh, oh, Mike, you're, you're so amazing. You can. That's not my point at all. My point is, with just the text of Scripture, you can find these things. That's the point. With just reading it and going, hmm, I know Jesus, and I know who he was and what he did. Let me look at Moses, who he was and what he did, and see the connections. It's just an exciting, fun way to study the Scriptures. So here we go. Let's start chronologically. Because in the infancy of Moses, we already have a connection between him and Jesus. And uh, we, don't really, we don't have to read very far to find parallels. So in Exodus 1, verse 22, um, here's the story of Moses' birth. It says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is the environment to which Moses was born. He's born at this time where Pharaoh's like has anxiety about how many Hebrews are being born. And so he's like, let's kill off the men, let's keep the females, and then we can reduce the power of their numbers. And so um, Exodus 2, verse 2, speaking of his mother, it says, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took him for a basket, not took him for a basket, but she took for him a basket, which is very different, uh, made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women, woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And so she takes him in and raises him in Pharaoh's home. So here he is under the shadow of this attack from this uh, non-Jewish king who's trying to kill or eradicate the Jewish infants, and then or Hebrew infants. And then he's sort of whisked away and brought into Pharaoh's household and raised there in safety in the middle of this trouble. Then we get to Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, we read about the story of Jesus and how when he was born, there was a similar problem. Right? You already probably know this, but Matthew 2, let's just read the text. Matthew 2, 12. Um, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. That would be the, the wise men or the magi. Um, verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time he had ascertained from the wise men. So Moses is hunted by a Gentile king. Jesus is hunted by Herod, who is effectively, he was not really Jewish. At least that was the discussion that the Jews were having. Is he even really a Jewish king? He was more of a Roman king. 
for the Jews. Um, he's hunted, yet he survives the massacre of infants, just as Moses survived the massacre of these infants. And then Moses, what does he do? He survives by going deeper into Egypt. He's raised in Pharaoh's household. Jesus, where does he go? Into Egypt. In fact, Matthew, to show another theme we see in scripture, in Hosea 11.1, 1, Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1 1 by saying, out of Egypt I have called my son, a passage that on the surface looks like it's actually about Israel, not about Jesus or Messiah. But what we see when we zoom out at the Bible, we see this whole going into Egypt, coming out of Egypt theme in the scriptures. Moses does it. He goes into Egypt. He comes out. Then he goes back in and he comes back out. Israel, they go into Egypt. They come back out. Abraham, did you know Abraham in his life? He went into Egypt, came back out. Um, we see uh, Christ now going into Egypt and coming back out. So we're seeing that there's a theme, a thematic element that Matthew's pointing out here. Okay, so that's just the infancy. Now let's look at his first coming. Did you know Moses kind of had two times where he showed up to the people of Israel? Uh, we can read about this in the book of Acts, actually. So Acts chapter 7, the parallel passage is Ezekiel 2, or excuse me, Exodus 2. We'll come to that in a minute. But in Acts 7, remember this is that passage I gave you for homework a couple times? Acts 7, because Acts 7 is kind of where Stephen, he unpacks a bunch of typology of Christ in the Old Testament. So it's a New Testament commentary of typology, pretty neat stuff. But in Acts 7.23, it speaks about Moses and it says, When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And I've underlined the word in my, my notes, visit, visit. Remember that word. He visited the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. This Egyptian was abusing and hurting, harming somehow this, this Hebrew slave. Moses killed the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Sound familiar? They should have understood that this was salvation coming by the hand of Moses, just as they should have understood it was by Jesus that salvation was coming, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? So he's trying to bring unity to them. He's trying to gather the people together. <clears throat> but the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And this retort, at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So what I'm pointing out here is this. Moses... He, he didn't just come when he was old, you know, from the wilderness to say, hey, Egypt, you know, let my people go. There was an initial coming, a first coming, and it's recorded there, and it's also recorded in Exodus 2, where Moses shows up, and he's rejected by the, Israeli, the Israelites. He's rejected by the Jewish people. So this is <clears throat> connected, I think, to Jesus. Uh, I'll give you an example. Luke 19.44, it says, Jesus pronouncing judgment on, on Jerusalem, and he tells them why. He says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Moses came and visited the people. He wasn't hanging with the slaves. He's in the house of Pharaoh. Comes down, visits the people, defends one of them. This is symbolic of him bringing them liberty. They don't recognize it. They attack. They come against him. And as we read about this in Exodus 2, it adds one more element to this. It says, um, Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known, because the Hebrews were talking about it. They were gossiping about it, basically. And in Exodus 2.15, it says, when Pharaoh heard of it, when he finds out about what Moses did, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. We'll come back to that in just a moment. <clears throat> but rejection by the Israelites is a theme in the life of Moses. How would you like rejection to be a theme in your life? Well, maybe. <laughs> Maybe you're like Jesus, you know. But in this case, it really is. It's a theme in Moses' life. Um, multiple times, the Israel, Israelites reject him. They reject him in his first coming. But then even later on, they try to kill him when they're like, this ain't working out, let's kill Moses. Like they're murmuring and grumbling and plotting to kill him. This directly parallels Jesus when they murmured and grumbled and tried to kill him. In the Gospels, we read about this. Other leaders tried to replace him. Did you, do you, did you notice that with Moses, right? There's a time where uh, he goes up on the mountain and they say, Aaron, you'll be the new Moses guy, right? We'll make this calf out of gold. We'll like say, that's Yahweh. They actually call the calf Yahweh, right? And, then, and they're like, we'll replace Moses with Aaron. We'll replace Yahweh with this golden calf. We're good. They tried to replace him. I, this is ironic to me because there are, uh, there's a theme here that 
as Moses couldn't be replaced by Aaron, so Jesus can't be replaced by the priesthood. Aaron is the, the, the ultimate symbol of the priesthood because it's from his line that all the priests come, right? All the Aaronic, the high priests, they all come from him. So they, they can't replace Jesus. That's the theme I see there. Um, the sons of Korah, who were also priests, the sons of Korah, they tried to lead a rebellion against him, and then God struck them down. You cannot take his place. And so Jesus, you can't take his place. He is the ultimate one. Now, <clears throat> um, after his initial rejection by the, uh, the Israelites, Moses goes out into the land of Midian, which is ultimately Gentile land, right? Non-Jewish land, as, as pretty much everywhere was, <laughs> except for where the Jews happen to be at that exact moment. So Exodus 2.15, let's read this again. And we'll read through verse 22. <clears throat> when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. And when they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, uh, how is it? that you've come home so soon today. They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? And keep in mind, he's got seven daughters. So like if I've learned anything from Allison making me watch um, Pride and Prejudice, thank you, I almost forgot the name of it, she would have killed me. Um, from watching Pride and Prejudice with Allison is that when you have lots of daughters, you want to marry them off as quickly as possible. So he's got seven daughters. He's like, where's that man? Bring him over here. Um, so he's like, where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. She gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. So Moses in his time where he's, he's rejected by Israel in his first coming, right? He's rejected. He goes out and he's with the Gentiles and he makes a life amongst the Gentiles. Interesting. Um, in, uh, he drives out the bad shepherds and he gives water to the flock. That's his initial moment. There's not much more we know about his whole time there. It's like 40 years. Yeah, he, this is what he did, you know. So he becomes a shepherd. He drives out the bad shepherds and he gives water to the flock. In Matthew 23, 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. These shepherds came and they wouldn't let the flocks get the water. Moses comes and he goes, ah, get out of here. I will bring water to the flock. So Jesus shows up and he's in a situation where the shepherds of Israel are not giving the water to the people. And he says, ah, and he, dri he drives at them or drives them out, so to speak, even literally some of them out of the temple. And he says, then come and I will give you water. In Revelation 21.6, Jesus speaking, it, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Without payment. In Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Now, you might be like, Mike, this is kind of a weak connection. He gave water to the flocks. Stick with me. Stick with me, because I'm going to make it stronger. <laughs> I'll make it stronger. So it's about to drink some milk and get even stronger. But follow with me here. In John 7, 37, Jesus gives us another, another statement about the whole water thing. So John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, this would be the Feast of Tabernacles, that great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this is interesting, this great day of the feast. What you may not know just by reading the text is um, the Jewish people tend to add on extra traditions onto the feasts, which is fine. They're not, traditions aren't necessarily bad. Just don't call them the commandments of God when you have your traditions. Have them and know their traditions. Um, but they have their traditions, and one of the traditions is the priest, every day of this feast, he goes down, he has a golden pitcher, and he dips it into the, pool, the, the, the stream of uh, Siloam, is it? Let me, or is it? No, Siloah because Siloam is a pool. So Siloa, he dips into the stream of Siloa, and then he brings it up, and he pours it out up at the temple. That's what he does every day. He pours it out. So the priest would do this. And then on the last day, there would be the biggest hoopla about this event. And, and this is the day where Jesus stands up, and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's like saying, I'm the one who's going to give you the living water. I'm the one who's going to provide you with the water. 
Now, what's interesting is um, the priests, while he's pouring this water and while they're marching up, they would sing songs. One of the songs they would sing is Isaiah 12, 3. They would sing with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So here I'm not connecting so much Moses and Jesus here. I'm just connecting Jesus and the concept of water. And Jesus is the fulfillment of God providing water for his people. And he clearly says it in the New Testament. I'm going to give you living water. He clearly declares it in Revelation as well as here in John. Now, you might think that's a bit of a stretch, but I'll say this. Um, uh, Moses gave them water at other times, too, and he was known for bringing forth water, right? He brings forth water from the rock multiple times. He brings water to these shepherds. But my point here is, who did he give water to first? The Jews or non-Jews? Gentiles. This is interesting, just like how Joseph ended up helping the Gentiles and then the Jews. Now, the gospel went out Jew first, then Gentile, but it was rejected largely by the Jewish people. Now, a massive group of Gentiles have been saved and put their faith in Christ, but there's yet a time coming when the deliverance will come to the Jewish people and there will be a Jewish revival, at least that's my understanding of prophecy. He also, Moses, while he goes out there, he marries a Gentile bride, Zipporah. He marries a Gentile bride, kind of like Joseph. We see a theme here. So in Exodus 2.21... I'll read it to you again. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. Then in Acts 18.6, we read the following. And when they opposed and reviled him, this is speaking of Paul, he goes, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm innocent from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. Now, what you have to understand about Acts 18.6 is it might not, it may just seem like a random verse, but this is like a thematic theme. I guess it's just a theme. Because a thematic theme would just be a redundancy. Um, but, but it's a theme in the book of Acts where, um, where the gospel goes to the Jew first and slowly it's going more and more to the Gentiles as the Jews reject and persecute. And so Acts 18.6 is like kind of a turning point in the book in a big way. And so my point here is the, the, the story of the message of Jesus going out and being received by the Gentiles, rejected by the Jews, well, that's exactly what happened to Moses. He goes out, he marries a Gentile bride. Um, very interesting. And if you can remember, we did this last week, but in Luke chapter 4, or it might have been two weeks ago, um, Jesus talks about, he's in Nazareth, his hometown, and he talks about how in the Old Testament there was two examples, Elijah and Elisha, and how Elijah, how there were lots of widows in Elijah's time, but he only helped this one particular widow who was a Gentile, and how in Elisha's time there were lots of lepers, but he only helped one leper, and it was a Gentile. And then they're like, we're going to kill you for saying that. Of course, Jesus is just doing a Bible study. Um, he's just telling them this is what it says in the text. So again, we have a theme about the Gentiles getting this message. Now, the second time Moses comes, he is received. He is received. And in the second coming, when he shows up, he's coming to draw his people out of Egypt. And he comes with plagues, the ten plagues on Egypt. Um, now, these, these plagues are all really interesting. You could do a whole study easily on just the 10 plagues and talk about how they relate to different Egyptian deities, like God was showing that he's got the power and they don't kind of thing. But when we read in the Bible about Jesus's second coming in the book of Revelation, we see a lot of parallels between that and the Exodus. God's coming to deliver his people. He, he brings judgment. Uh, we'll come back to this later about how Revelation connects specifically Jesus and Moses. That'll be towards the end when I bring in some other New Testament passages. But what's interesting about the plagues and Revelation is this. The ten plagues on Egypt, some of them fell on everybody. And, and as, as they continued to get worse and worse, they started to only fall onto the Egyptians, not the Israelis, not the Jews. So it is with the book of Revelation. As you read about the things God seals his people and then the plague or the locust, whatever it is, it just doesn't bother God's people. It only bothers the unsaved or the unsealed. Okay, then we come to what I think is a wrongly mocked passage of scripture and it's Numbers 12, 3. This is where Moses, it's said, was extremely humble. And people like to point out that Moses wrote Numbers 12, 3. Um, but I'd imagine only a really humble guy could say this about himself. Oh, or a really arrogant guy who's lying. <laughs> but, but in Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek or very humble, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now this is where I've, I've heard pastors teach this passage, Numbers, and they come to this and they mock it and move on. Like it's okay to mock what the Bible says. And I'm like, are you, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> like, just put a lightning rod on top of your church and then do it. But um, no, I, 
Instead, I read it and I thought, no, there's got to be a legitimate reason why it says this. And as I thought about the life of Moses, there's one thing I noticed about him that would make him, in a measurable way, the humblest guy around. And that is that he was, he was part of the royal family of Pharaoh. And he gave that up to be identified with the slaves. He could have just kept his mouth shut. He was part of Pharaoh's family. He looked Egyptian. He talked Egyptian. And he could have just kept that and his privilege. And instead, he identifies himself with his people. And because of this, he is cast out. He loses everything. They try to kill him. That's, that's the humility that's exampled. And you might be like, hmm, well, that's interesting, Mike. But I, I would draw your attention into Philippians 2 when it tells us why Jesus was so humble. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death, uh, even death on a cross. So Moses' humility is giving up his royal place in the house of Pharaoh, which is kind of a big deal. And then Jesus' humility is giving up heaven, giving up his, his position, his rightful position, and coming as a servant, as a human. I see that connection. Now, the New Testament actually gives us this interpretation as well. So let me read to you Hebrews 11 that I think ties Jesus and Moses together um, in the same way that I'm doing. So Hebrews 11:24, 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered, and this phrase is really interesting, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not, af- not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I think that whole, con- that whole statement there is all just dripping with typology. But let me just point out a couple little things. Um, it says here that Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? You're like, well, how much did Moses know about Christ? May I say this? This this passage may not be about how much Moses knew about Messiah. It may be that Moses, when he left Pharaoh and identified with the people of God to be part of what God was doing, this is the reproach of Christ because Jesus, he leaves the Father's side. He comes down. He lives as a human. He becomes reproached, right? It's it's typologically connected to Jesus Christ. Um, so it's not that I think Moses had like all this secret information. I think he had the information we see in, in, in the text of the Old Testament, all these types and pictures and some ideas about the Messiah. He prophesies specifically, I think, about Messiah. I'll talk about that later. But yeah, interesting stuff. So him leaving Pharaoh's, the position of Pharaoh's household is connected to Jesus leaving uh, heaven. All right, Moses, another connection. Moses brought in the covenant of the law, the covenant of the law. And we read about this in Exodus 24. So I'll read Exodus 24, verse 6 through 8 here. And Moses took half of the blood, speaking of this blood sacrifice, and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses brings them a covenant, and the covenant is the law of Moses. You obey this law, God will bless you. You disobey, God will what? Curse you. Blessings and curses. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. This is a performance-based covenant, right? You better do it, and you'll live. You don't do it, and you die. In Romans 10, 5, the New Testament talks about this. This is for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, performance, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. That's a quote from Leviticus. If you do this, you live. If you don't do it, you die. But the problem is the people of Israel failed. And they failed royally, as you would and as I would. Not because they're worse, but because they're pretty much people, normal people. Israel is a group of people that God called. He says, not because you were greater, but because I wanted to show myself powerful. They're just the same kind of people as you and me. Especially if you're actually Jewish, then it's especially like you. (laughs) Because you might. I'm not, but. All right, sorry. I entertain myself. I just wish I could entertain someone else. (laughs) Um, 
So the problem is they failed. So in, so Moses has a, a sidekick, so to speak, Joshua, right? Joshua travels with them for many years. And then after Moses dies, Joshua takes over. And then in the book of Joshua, we, Joshua, in, the, in, the, in other words, is eyewitness to the law being given. He's eyewitness to the people promising to obey it. He's eyewitness to what happened next. And then finally, at the end, he says this in Joshua 24, 19. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. I mean, Joshua just straight up goes like, no, you won't. And they go, oh, we will. And he goes, you're not gonna. And he goes, yeah, we will. And he goes, all right. <laughs> Okay, you made the commitment, you made the deal. So we get the problem of the Old Covenant. The problem of the Old Covenant isn't that anything's wrong with the law of the Old Testament. It's that people can't perform it because something's wrong with us. Like, I'm a sinner. Why do I know what's good and I don't do it? And then when I have God show me what's good and he makes the standards even higher than what I thought they were, it just points it out even more how bad I am. And hello, that is the point of the law. It's our, le it's our schoolmaster, our tutor, to drive us to Christ, to say, hey, you need Jesus. Sometimes you teach people by letting them fail. You just allow them to go ahead and try it on your own. Okay, now are you willing to accept help? That's what the law is meant to give us, that. So Jesus, just like Moses brought in the law that brought death, Jesus brings in the new covenant. So we actually read about there's, there's this promise about a new covenant in the Old Testament. We read about it in Jeremiah 31. It's really the one place where God clearly says there is a, another covenant coming long after the covenant of Moses, and it's better than the covenant of of the law. So Jeremiah 31, 31, he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, not written on tablets for you to obey, but written inside of you. And will no longer, or and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this is this new covenant isn't a obey and you'll live. It's I'm going to renew you. I'm going to refresh you. I'm going to put goodness, my, my law inside of you. I'll forgive your sins and I won't remember them anymore. That's my kind of covenant. You know, it's like, like that works for me. Jesus shows up in, think of this context now. Moses gives a law, they fail. Jeremiah prophesies a new law. Jesus shows up and in Luke 22:20, 20, he clearly applies this to himself. At Passover, he takes the cup. It says, likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus straight up says, my blood, that's the new covenant. That's the new thing because you failed the old. Just this beautiful, beautiful parallels that are there. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it says that God has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, this is one of those verses I hear abused all the time. Whenever someone doesn't like rules, they go, the letter kills. I'll be like, dude, that's about the Old Testament law killing you because you don't obey it, not because something's wrong with it, right? The letter kills. It's like cops write tickets and the letter kills. Does that make cops bad or speeders bad? You know, speeders, is that a term? Speedsters. So this is, this is um, the letter being the law, but, the, but Christ, he's gonna, the Spirit's going to give us life. And then Hebrews 8, 6. It also connects Moses and Jesus connecting with the covenants as well. It says, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Why are they better promises? Well, what promise do you want? Obey and live, disobey and die, or I will forgive you and wash you and I will change you from the inside out. Like, I know which one I think is better. And that's what Hebrews is saying. It's a better covenant because it, it meets the needs of a sinner to bring us salvation. So obviously there's a lot more we could talk about with the law and how the law represents Christ or how Christ, I should say, fulfills the law. Um, but we'll move forward. Um, one of the things you'll notice about Israel is I was just kind of like serving in my head the story of the Exodus is that Israel, like 
they get ransomed and rescued out of Egypt. They're brought out of Egypt. But what do they do to make it happen? Nothing. Like they don't fight the Egyptians. They don't plot and plan. If anything, they make it harder. They do nothing to get out of this bondage. And in that I see Christ our Savior. He comes and he delivers us and we do nothing to receive this except to trust in him. That's all we do is believe. In fact, you could say the Passover, they offered a, the one thing that they maybe did in all of the 10 plagues was they had one offering of a Passover lamb, of a lamb, right? The whole uh, unleavened and all the whole series of events that took place for the Passover, which maybe, maybe I'll talk about that by itself one day because it's so involved. Um, but they just do this one thing, they offer this one lamb, and yet it's then a substitute. Instead of their firstborn, they offer this meaning that there's like a sense in which a firstborn is offered, a substitute is given. So really, um, I see that connected to Jesus. Obviously, Jesus says this is the covenant, the new covenant as they're celebrating that exact meal, that Passover. In John 6, 29, Jesus says, uh, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. What do I have to do? He goes, just believe. Just believe. But that's not even work. He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm going to do it all. <laughs> you, just, you just believe. So... In Exodus 15, we have the Song of Moses. This is this really interesting passage because it's his song. It's his like official song. Like he had a one, he had a one, one hit wonder, Moses. Unless you count the one psalm he wrote as well. But, but yeah, so he, he had his, uh, his moment, his, his spotlight time. And that was the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. But in this, he recounts the story of the Exodus, of them leaving Egypt. And the way he describes it is really interesting. It says in verse 13, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. He talks about how God has redeemed Israel. And this literally means to purchase back. I bought you back. That's the idea. And to me, this is a kind of a question mark because you're like, how exactly did he buy them when you read the story of the Exodus? It's like, why does he describe it in these terms? And I think the reason is because Jesus redeems us. So Moses speaks of this redemption. Christ ultimately fulfills it. Uh, Titus 2.14, it says, Who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a special people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So we're redeemed by him. Then we have um, Moses' function as an intercessor. Moses interceded for the people frequently, like on a regular basis, this seems to happen. And what I mean by intercede is this. God's like, I'm going to destroy them. And they're like, deserving it. That's their part, right? <laughs> and then Moses gets between the two and he goes, God, please have mercy upon them. And he intercedes. He like, his prayers and his presence stops God from judging the people. Now, outside of Jesus, you go, how do you explain that? Right? But when in light of Christ, it makes total sense. So here's an example. In, on Mount Sinai, 10 minutes after they leave Egypt, God's about to kill them. Um, I'm exaggerating, but yes. In Exodus 32, 30, we read about it. It says, the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord, up, up the mountain to the Lord. Perhaps I can make, and listen to what he says, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Perhaps I can do something that will, that will, reconnect you to God and deal with your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. And this is a really bold and shocking thing to hear Moses say. Now later Moses is like, I hate these people. That's, or at least that seems to be the that seems to be the vibe he gets. But at the moment, he's like very much like, God, wipe me out too. If you're gonna blot them out, blot me out too. Now, does Moses do anything to make atonement? All he does is offer himself with them. Judge me too, then. And God responds by redirecting, he change, almost changes the subject but he does not judge the people. But I feel as though God has painted the picture that's meant to represent Jesus as our intercessor. Moses is just meant to represent it. This kind of thing happens repeatedly, these sort of replacements, right? Where, um, where the lamb is offered instead of the firstborn, the ram is offered instead of Isaac. There's this replacement to, to picture Christ as the one who goes in our place 
to suffer and die for us. There's more information on this same story in Deuteronomy 9. So in Deuteronomy 9, we hear a little more details. <clears throat> this is when he's recounting what happened when he went up the mountain. And he says, Then I lay prostrate before the Lord, as before, forty days and forty nights, I ate, I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you had committed. So he apparently was fasting for a long time, and he and it's interesting he says why. He goes, I didn't eat or drink because of the sin you had committed. But that was the reason for his fasting, was their sin. He he fasted. Moses fasts for someone else's sin issues. That's just, he's putting himself in between them. He's interceding for them, right? In doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you, so that he was ready to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. And God listened to him, so that didn't happen. And I, I, I get this too. Jesus, he also fasted, right? Jesus fasts. And you're like, why did Jesus fast? Well, he fasted for you. He fasted as part of the whole, this seems, the fasting of Christ seems to be not only him facing temptation, but him, part of his suffering and part of him connecting even him and Moses in this sort of for our sins nature of his fasting. I think that's very interesting. Now, sometime later, Israel marches and they travel, I think it was 11 days to get up to the front of the promised land. They get there, the promised land is before them. And they send out spies, and they hear a report that there's giant grapes, but there's also giant guys. And we don't like it, so we don't want to go in. Moses, you tricked us. You brought out here to kill us. You brought us out here to kill us. And they, they don't believe. So they refuse to enter the land. We read out this in Numbers 11. Um, in Numbers, uh, excuse me, Numbers 14, verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? He straight up calls it out. The problem with you not entering the promised land is you don't believe me. You don't believe in me. In spite of all the signs that I've done among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Okay, so once again, now they're in front of the promised land. God's like, I'm going to kill them all, and Moses, I can make kids through you. Generations later, they'll be a nation better than these guys. Now, did God intend to do that? No, I think he's trying to draw a picture for us. Because the next thing that happens, verse 13, it says, But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians, and he goes on, he's like, Then the Egyptians are going to think that you're not true to your word. And so he, he appeals to God's own glory. God, in other words, God's promise. He's like, God, don't save them because of how good they are. Save them because you promised. So this is our salvation being based on promise, not upon our goodness. And then verse 17 and now, please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. He's repeating God's words back to God about God's character. God, you are forgiving. So then verse 19, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you, you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. I almost see a connection here between the fact that Jesus, it says all judgment was given to the son and Jesus comes and he goes, I condemn no one. Right? And then he becomes the one who, if, if you come to him, if you receive him, you will be forgiven. Really interesting, interesting stuff. Um, so Moses as intercessor, this is a repeated theme in Moses' life. Of course, Jesus, our ultimate intercessor. And then Moses' unique relationship with God. In Numbers 12, we read about how Aaron and Miriam decided that they were just as good as Mo, and they wanted Mo authority, and they wanted Mo attention. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. Um, so in Numbers 12, 6, God comes and he's like, who do you think you are? Because they're like, Moses, who do you think you are? So God tells Aaron and Miriam, who do you think you are? And he says, in Numbers 12, 6, hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, meaning not clearly. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. That's actually quoted in Hebrews 3 later about Jesus. Um, with him, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God is saying, with Moses, I have a unique relationship, different even than the prophets. Even than the prophets. This thing with Moses is unique. And Christ comes 
And he, like Moses, has a unique relationship with God, even escalated above and beyond that of Moses, because he says that he came from the Father and he's going back to the Father and he speaks the things which he heard with the Father. So he's speaking and he, he has, in other words, more information and clearer knowledge than even the prophets. That's the connection between him and Jesus there. There's a lot of verses that, where Jesus makes that point. Um, but the point again, Jesus just has a greater relationship with the Father and he makes him known. Now, remember this, Moses, right? This guy, he's, he's much greater. He's greater in a sense than the prophets. God's connection and communication with him. But then in Matthew 17, we have an event, the one time in Jesus' earthly life where Moses shows up. And we got Moses and Jesus in the same space. And it's in the transfiguration account, Matthew 17. I'll read it to you. It says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves, such so as Peter, James, John, and Jesus. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared that to them Moses and Elijah talking with him, talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now here's Jesus and Moses and Elijah all together. And remember how important Moses is. Verse 5, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He's got Moses and Elijah there and they're, and they're being told, listen to Jesus. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. It's, now, why were Moses and Elijah there? Well, all, the only thing we can see clearly in the text is Moses and Elijah are brought there to show that Jesus is more important. To show that Jesus is to be listened to above and beyond them. He is seen as more glorious than Moses and Elijah. And he is. And so, as Moses was connected to God, Jesus more so. Uh, Moses also only reflected God's glory. Jesus, he had his own. He just is glorious. We'll get there in a minute, but there's a, there's a time where Moses comes into the presence of God. He leaves God's presence and his face is shining, but it's not like as glorious as Jesus' face. So, there's an escalation. And in typology, we always look for escalation. We look for, how is Jesus better than that? And don't think it breaks the type when you're like, oh, but they failed. There. Actually, that's kind of the point. Jesus is, the anticipa is anticipated by their failure even. Okay, more points. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, I'm not done yet. Um, Jesus, or uh, Moses, Moses led them to the promised land, right? He leads them up to the promised land, but he doesn't bring them in. Moses dies in the wilderness with the rest of them. Jesus, he brings us in. He fulfills the promises of God. The law brings you up to the edge of the promised land and it says, uh -uh, you fail. You can't get in. Here's a glimpse of heaven. You're not going to get to go there. That's what the law does to us. It reveals to us our failures, our sins. Christ, he brings us in. In fact, it's interesting that Joshua is the name of the guy who actually brings them into the promised land, which is the exact same name, Jesus, Yehoshua, um, or Yeshua, the uh, shorter form. But it's the same name, Jesus. Joshua. <clears throat> so Moses couldn't give them rest, but Jesus does give them rest. Moses has an interesting statement he gives as to why he couldn't enter the land. Because I know what you're thinking. You're like, I know this. I know the Bible, Mike. Stop. I know. I already know all that. All right, Moses, what did he do? Why couldn't he enter the land? He struck the rock the second time. You, you blew it, man. Why'd you do that? You didn't hollow God, honor what God told you to do. And that would have painted a better picture of Christ. But... Deuteronomy 3.26, listen to what Moses says about why he couldn't enter the land, because it was more complicated than that. There was more than one reason, I think. Deuteronomy 3.26, 3, but the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. This is when Moses is like, I want to go in. And God's like, no. God was angry with Moses on account of the people. So Moses dies outside of the promised land. He dies, in a sense, in exile. I think there's a connection here between Moses and Jesus as well. Because Christ, God is symbolically here, right, angry. I don't know if I would use that term normally, but, but he, his, his uh, judgment falls upon Jesus 
on account of us. So he dies. In Joshua 1, 2, I mean, that's kind of what Psalm 22 talks about, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from the words of my groaning? And then he talks, and obviously God has not truly forsaken him in, this, in some final sense, rather. This is speaking about the judgment and the, the, the payment of sins being made on the cross. But in Joshua 1, 2, it says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. There's this, this uh, now he's dead, now you can enter in. Now that Christ has died for us, now we can enter in. So in a sense, we see a, a connection that's there. Now, some of these, you might go, Mike, I don't know if I follow with, that, with you on that one. And I would just be like, that's totally fine. Maybe I'm wrong. Consider it. Think about it. These are connections that I think I see and I think are worth at least saying out loud. And I'd like for you to consider them as well. I think some of them are very clear and other ones perhaps not as clear. So Moses gave them a burden, the law, which they, which they knew they could not obey, right? Jesus, he takes the burden. Um, in fact, they would call the law the yoke. In Acts 15, there's a debate in Acts 15 in the early church. Should we make the Gentiles obey the law? And they call it the yoke that they were not able to bear. That's the phrase used. Um, they say, why would we put a yoke on the, on the Gentiles that we were not able to bear? They call it the law, the yoke, right? Well, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ's uh, calling to us is something we can accomplish. We can follow Christ. We can walk in Christ. We weren't able to obey the law. Okay, more connections. Moses, he led them out of bondage to the Egyptians. Jesus leads us out of bondage to sin. As he says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And he leads us out of that. So we're, we're in a slavery. Jesus leads us from the greater slavery of sin, not just to a, a people group. Moses led them up to the promised land, but they couldn't enter. Why? Because of unbelief unbelief, right? He says, they, they don't believe me, that God says they do not believe me. Jesus pays it all and we enter in by simply believing. It's just believing. It's just a faith issue. Let's talk now about how Moses' face was glowing. Uh, so in Exodus chapter 34, we read about this. Moses' face glows and God seems to use this to illustrate a really interesting point. So as I read the passage, I want you to notice the fade. Notice how it describes how Moses was fading. His, his, the glory, of the shining of his face was fading and what they did about it. It's really interesting. Exodus 34, 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. I'll just point out real quick. His face was glowing not because of some glory in him, but because he had been in, in God's presence. And so now he's like, has what we call an afterglow. That's where the term came from, afterglow. Because of being in God's presence, now his face is glowing visibly. Not like, oh, you look so happy, you're glowing. No, this is like, he was glowing. Like, this was something much more than that. Um, Jesus, when he, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he glowed of his own glory, it seems. So there's, it's a greater sense. Now, verse 30, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. They're just scared. They don't, they're like, what, what's going on? But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the elders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. So when he declares God's word, is there a veil over his face? No, nope. he's like, no veil. I'm going to tell you everything God said. And as soon as he's done, that's all I had to tell you. And he puts a veil over his face. Let's keep reading. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what it was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Moses, during this season, always covered his face unless he was declaring God's word, in which case his face was glowing temporarily. But that means that if you were an Israelite and you looked at Moses, every time you saw his face, what was it doing? Glowing, glowing every single time. You always saw it. The, what did the veil hide from you? The fact that it wasn't going to always be glowing. 
Okay, so you got that. That's the Old Testament principle. Now, what does the New Testament do with this? 2 Corinthians 11, or verse 3. Verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. There's no 11 in there at all. 2 Corinthians 3, 12, it says, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face, so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. What are they not gazing at? They're not gazing at the fading of the glory. They're not gazing at how it would fade. So the veil covers the fact that he's, Moses is fading. But their minds were hardened for to this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. They can't tell Moses is fading even now. The Israelites who have not received Christ don't realize that, Je- that Jesus is the conclusion. You know, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of Moses. Yes, to this day, verse 15, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil's removed. Now the Lord is spirit, is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. A complicated passage, no doubt, but you get the idea. Moses was fading, and you couldn't tell. But it was written in the past in, in the Old Testament, wasn't it? This picture God's drawing that it that it was fading. Christ, however, his glory is only an increasing glory. More from one degree to another, we're growing in seeing the glory of God. We we see Christ's kingdom will come, it'll become more and more glorious, this world forever. And then we are also being changed ourselves to be conformed more and more to his image. So it's the opposite of of that with Moses. And this connects me to John the Baptist. So let me bring in John the Baptist just for a second. In Matthew 11, we read what Jesus said about John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Jesus is like all the the prophets and law, they prophesied until John. John's like the, the final thing of the law and the prophets. And look at what John said about Jesus. If John represents law and prophets. John 3.30, John says, this verse we we often use, right? He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, I'm not at all promoting some idea that we throw out the Old Testament. No, 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 no. This is the opposite of that. Uh, We're seeing the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but we recognize a fading or a handing off of the glory to Christ that happens as Jesus shows up. So interesting, interesting stuff. Now you might think, Mike, you're, you're taking too many liberties. Like you can't really read the Bible like that. Like ancient Jews would never read the Bible like that, Mike. You're just, you're, and, I, and I would just say, actually they would read the Bible with way more liberty than I'm doing today. They have what's called Midrash. And a Midrash is a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament that's meant to look at the deeper meaning of the Old Testament. So let me just quote to you, an ancient rabbinical source goes back to around 300 AD. This is ancient Jewish source that looks at Moses and how he relates to Messiah. Because I just think that stuff's cool. <laughs> so, so here we go. Um, this is Midrash Rabbah on Ecclesiastes relates how Rabbi Berechiah said in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak, who lived before the year 300 AD. And that, that's, by the way, that's just how these things are. They're always recounting which rabbi said what. And then they tell you what they said. This is why um, Jesus taught different than their rabbis. Like, he's not quoting anybody. He's just, like, teaching us. Um, But it says here, Just as there was a first Savior, that's Moses, by the way, there will be a last. Just as it is said of the first Savior in Exodus 4.20 that he took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey. This is speaking of of that passage where he was in exile. Um, So it is said of the last savior that he is lowly and riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. This is ancient Jewish rabbinical teaching saying, just like Moses was put his, his wife on a donkey, so the last savior comes in riding on a donkey, the Messiah. As the first savior provided manna, Exodus 16, as it is written, behold, I will pour out bread from heaven upon you. So will the last savior, as it is written in Psalm 72, 16, let corn abound throughout the land. Just as the first savior opened the, opened a fountain as Moses struck the rock. So the last savior will provide water as it is written, Joel 3, 18, a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. 
Here's ancient rabbinical teaching where they connect Moses and Messiah. This is not a new idea. That's the, that's the point here. Um, as you do a survey of even the miracles of Moses, you get things like Moses, he gives manna from heaven. Jesus says he is the bread from heaven, the true bread from heaven, right? Moses lifted up the bronze serpent. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, so the son of man will be lifted up. Moses gave them water from the rock that was struck. Jesus was struck to give us the living water. Moses gave them the law. Jesus gave them grace. Moses took them through the Red Sea. Jesus takes us through death into life. And he ultimately answers all of the typology, I think, of Moses. Now, there's actually a few other things I want to cover real quick, which are New Testament, other New Testament teachings and one Old Testament teaching that make it even more clear that Moses is supposed to be a type of the Messiah. Um, so Hebrews 11, verse 23 or actually, I kind of covered this one, so I'm going to move forward. We'll do Hebrews 3. This is the New Testament speaking about how Moses is connected to Jesus. Hebrews 3. I mentioned I'd covered, come to this passage earlier. Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Remember earlier we read, God tells Mo, uh, Miriam and Aaron, uh, Moses is faithful in my house. And then here we read the connection to Jesus. Jesus, is, verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. That's also a deity of Christ passage there. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later prophetically, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Specific points, right? Uh, Moses was faithful. Jesus was faithful. Um, Moses was glorious in a sense, but Christ was more glorious. We've already talked about that. And um, Moses is part of the house. Jesus is the builder. Jesus comes before and after. He designed the whole thing. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Moses was a servant. Christ is the son. So typology, again, involves escalation. We, we make, it gets bigger with Jesus. That's the idea. Then, in Revelation 15, we have the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Now, this is interesting because here's a song in the book of Revelation that literally connects Moses and Jesus in one song. So Revelation 15.3 it says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, and here's what they say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Now the song of Moses came originally after the exodus, after the judgments of God manifested in the plagues. And this song in Revelation comes as God is manifesting his judgments in the second coming of Jesus. Again, tying Exodus with the second coming. And I think that's pretty interesting stuff. So, one last point that I want to make. <laughs> and this is, this is where the book of Deuteronomy um, just straight up says, there's someone who's going to be like Moses who's going to come. And this is in Deuteronomy. Um, we read about it in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Moses gives them a prophecy. And I'm going to read it to you, then I'll tell you how Jews for Judaism, which is a kind of anti-Christ, I don't mean that as an insult, they're, they're anti-Jesus movement. They try to say, stop missionaries from reaching out to Jewish people um, and prove us wrong on everything. And <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18.15, I'll read it, and then I'll read, tell you what they say about it. So the Lord your God, it says, Moses speaking, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Future, some prophet like Moses. Just as you desired the, of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they've spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So some future prophet, really, really big deal. Now, Jews for Judaism has a video online where 
by the way, they're named after, okay, so there's Jews for Jesus is a Jewish messianic ministry outreaching to Jewish people, showing them that Jesus is the Messiah. Jews for Judaism is a response to that ministry. So they have videos just meant to debunk whatever Jews for Jesus says. They say about this passage, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, it's a really long video, but they say about it, in short, Deuteronomy 18 is about Joshua. That's their interpretation. That's about Joshua. He was the prophet like Moses. He shows up, he leads him into the promised land, listen to Joshua. But then turn with me to Deuteronomy 34, because that couldn't possibly be the case. Deuteronomy 34, verse 10, this is written immediately after Joshua is handed the reins by Moses, right? Moses, he's, he's like, Joshua, you're the guy. And then it says in verse 10 of Deuteronomy 34, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his servants and to, and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. This prophet like Moses can't be Joshua because Deuteronomy 34 says, and then Joshua took over and someone like Moses hasn't come yet. So no, it hasn't, it's not Joshua. There's still a future prophet. Now what's interesting is when they did that, you guys know the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls are these ancient documents they found that go back to like the first century, even before, even as old as like 200 years before Christ. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was a Jewish community that, that had compiled these scrolls and then hid them basically in caves. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a document called 4Q Testimonia, like the word testimonial, but no L. 4Q Testimonia is an interesting document because it's just a list of what they believe to be messianic prophecies. So here we are, early Jewish, just list of messianic prophecies, you know. And one of those prophecies specifically on the list is Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18 and chapter 34. The idea that there's a prophet like Moses that is to come and is, is a messianic title. This is why in Acts 3, Peter was bold and willing to say, in, in Acts 34, I'm sorry, 34, in Acts 3, verse 22, and Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And Peter preached that Jesus was that guy. Pre Peter, from the beginning, preaching that Christ is the fulfillment of this. He's the prophet like Moses. And if you can't tell from the whole study we've just done, he's like Moses. I mean, he's like Moses, and, and, and point after point after point after point of correspondence between the two, he's like Moses. Without Jesus, though, the Old Testament becomes incomplete. He really fulfilled the law and the prophets. This is why in John 1, 45, when they first met Jesus, they say, we have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He is the fulfillment. It's beautiful stuff. I think there's more there, and you're welcome to go find it. Hopefully, I've whet your appetite. <laughs> Let's pray. Um, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophet like Moses who came, for Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that the grace that comes through Christ is so complete that you wash us and you make us new from the inside out by just having faith and trust in you. We're just grateful, Lord, for your love and your kindness. Um, and thank you for the great tapestry of Scripture and for showing us this, how smart you are <laughs> and how you've, you've really given us in the Bible, in the Word of God, just the most amazing thing we have on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.